A warm welcome to your vision this week on Channels Television. I'm Bukola Joe Oketumbi. Thank you so much for joining us. Aviation security is a combination of measures coupled with human and material resources to safeguard civil aviation against acts of lawful interference. While aviation security is the responsibility of states or governments, the effective partnership between government and industry is now more important than ever in the face of evolving security threats. Aviation security is our focus this week, plus other news. Our flight is set for takeoff. At a point in global history, commercial air travel was proof that aviation was leading the way in technology and innovation. The, service is is the greatest feats of engineering and modern luxury combined to create a commercial air experience unlike any other, but now replaced with long queues, complicated yet inadequate security systems, overcrowded flights and airports. Here in Nigeria, the Motala Mohammed International Airport has large numbers of people who pass through every day, presenting potential targets for terrorism and other forms of crime because of the number of people located in one place. With the aviation industry constantly faced by evolving threats, the International Civil Aviation Organization identified security culture as a top priority and designated 2020 as the year of security culture. The thinking here is that since airport is composed of organizations, Development of security culture in these organizations may not only go a long way in equipping airport personnel with the requisite knowledge and skills to assure the protection of persons and facilities by identifying and reporting suspicious activities for action. But in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ICAO Council decided to extend YOSC to 2021. Authorities say aviation security is not the same as airport security, as several agencies have their role in the overall chain, from passenger screening to boarding. Airport security is the totality of the activities of all the agencies and other people that are involved in working at the airport. Why aviation security is the combination of majors Human and material resources to safeguard civil aviation against acts of unlawful interference. And that is why we must begin to see ourselves, particularly when we are posted as security agencies, to come and support the security program of the airport and part and parcel of the system. Sensitive areas in airports, including airport ramps, operational spaces, are restricted from the general public. These spaces require special qualifications to enter. Systems can consist of physical access control gates or more passive systems that monitor people moving through restricted areas. Denying access to aircraft and installations of persons intent upon committing an act of violence and the prevention of the infiltration of weapons, explosives and other devices on board the aircraft. In aviation security, there are numerous and varied standards and practices. And this fundamental aim is to establish measures to prevent weapons or other dangerous devices which may be used to commit an act of unlawful interference from being introduced by any means whatsoever on board an aircraft engaged in civil aviation. Perimeter fences at airports should be the first layer of defense this is expected to minimize attacks and prevent incursion. And for the Federal Airport Authority, Nigeria, 
strengthening its collaboration with host communities towards building a robust security culture is key. We have sustained training and capacity development of security and non-security personnel in spite of the enormous setback caused by COVID-19 in a bid to guarantee a safe, secure and similar restart after the lockdown. We are working with FAN and other stakeholders to quickly actualize the approval of FEC for aviation security personnel to bear arms. And I'm glad to inform all that our approach so far has been holistic and result-oriented. The construction of shooting ranges at major airports is nearing completion. Like most industries, technology drives aviation. State-of-the-art screening and surveillance systems are currently replacing old and epileptic systems in order to improve efficiency and assure satisfactory customer experience. So it's imperative that the airport authority invest heavily in this area in order to enhance the security of flights, crew and passengers. On our interview segment, the Managing Director of the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria, Captain Ravi Yadudu, is our guest. He believes that there is no aviation security without adequate training for aviation security personnel. He adds that abductions in some airports across the country are seeing the agency scale up in its security processes. Aviation security is not only the personnel. All the measures we put in place is part of aviation security. And then there's the personnel, and then there's the equipment. So it's, a, it's a, like a substructure also, full of components. They make up aviation security. The well-organized and structured uh, director of aviation security with proper promotions, training, retrainings, recurrences, and participation across the world in all aviation security oriented or conferences or meetings or seminars. So we participate so that at any time we get the best information, the best material that is available within the industry. This is what it refers to the standard and recommended practices. We have them in aviation security, so we do that. And we have our equipment all, all over the country, screening machines, handhelds, vehicular and then we are the, we have the process of even maintaining and servicing this is all part of the provision of the security system and then we have networks in each airport working with the local community that you might not know it is very discreet there are so many things you do in security you don't want to alert people that i'm working with this man and then they avoid him so a lot of what we do is very discreet especially from last year to this year we stepped up a lot because of the COVID challenges and the social challenges that are also uh, apparently very, very challenging to us across the nation. And then within the next one hour, something happens to show there's a new danger, a new breach or a new possibility. The world you have now, suddenly there's a technology or there's a device people can use to scale and now you suddenly have to improve it. So it's like a race. But what we do is we try to be far ahead in the race. This is very important. So when we had those issues of people trying to gain access, and some even succeeded, I think last year or two years ago, we, looked, we, did, we did a very thorough study of the situation. We did a risk assessment, and what we found out, we did a lot in terms of strengthening the fencing, increasing the height, improving patrol uh, teams around the airport, and generally more sensitization. Because often we do not have people going around the airport position, you cannot have everybody stating. On the verge of recertifying Lagos and Abuja, and it is the same fund that we committed, we committed to certifying Enugu, Potakot, and Kano. But there are so many technical requirements and conditions that it is only when you engage in it, you fully appreciate the magnitude of the work. But the fact that we did Lagos and Abuja proves that we can easily do the others with the proper commitment. So certification involves our own teams within Nigeria are working and communicating uh, internationally, but that particular thing with the COVID, we are still in the COVID. Even though it is now under control, I believe and I pray this is the last we see of it. But COVID stopped almost everything in terms of whatever we are planning to, to do with our airport. And of course, the distress in our, in our resources. In fact, they are now rushing to key in those that are far behind or uh, they didn't want to do it on time. They've all keyed in. This is the latest technology. It has all the five major, I believe, five major requirements we need. We need departure control, FIDS, the flight information display system. We have the CUTE, 
we have the common user self-service uh, kiosk also. So mm -hmm. everything is there, and we even have, a, I think, a provision to do a lot of our responsibility to do with reconciliation mm -hmm. of our charges. Mm -hmm. This technology also has it. So we are trying to get the ones that we need for the processing, and then behind the scenes we work with CETA, uh, sorry, with RESA to. Uh, open this particular window to do with our charges and collection of our revenue mm -hmm. from the airlines. Mm -hmm. So it is fully online and uh, all our airlines are very happy now. And, uh, and of course, it also has a security function. The advanced passenger information is enhanced with this mm -hmm. because as they are doing it, it's going live to their destination, the information. So if there's any flag to be uh, raised mm -hmm. due to any passenger or passengers, we get to on time. We're back on track, fully improved and fully in operation. Yoba International Cargo Airport is one of the major projects inherited from the former administration of Ibrahim Gaydam, the immediate past governor of the state. The project suffered criticism on the ground that it was a misplaced priority and that the project would not be completed. In May 2020, two aeroplanes conveying the state governor, May Malabuni, and some officials landed at the airport. The state government and the project manager present an update on the project. As you can see, the project is almost at completion stage. On our own side, we have given them the reality. It is on ground now. In fact, Nigerian airports are already using the airport. It's already ready for certification by regular um, regulatory agencies. Some experts and residents explain the economic importance of the airport, especially now that Yobe State is the only one that doesn't have an airport in the northeast sub-region, despite its economic potential of agricultural activities. There has to be demand for products, for goods and services before those engage in producing, production, be it goods or services to sell those products. So if you don't have enough demand in the society, in the economy, definitely you may require some more demands from other countries, international demands. If achieved or attained at the end of the day, I think the people of Yubi is going to serve the people of Yubi a lot. One, in terms of employment, because it's going to create direct and indirect employment to them, because uh, we expect hospitality industries to come up. When people come and land, they'll have to eat, so they'll have to move either to restaurants or they'll have to move to uh, hotels. To spend the night. So this is a form of uh, employment. With the supply of equipment at the control tower, it's believed that the cargo airport when commissioned will not only create jobs but also boost livestock activities as well as transportation of agricultural produce to other parts of the country and the African continent. Chief Dr. William Marabro, Governor Willie Obiano, in company of the State Commissioner for Works and other state officers, take members of the Catholic Youth Organization of Nigeria to the Anambra State International Passenger and Cargo Airport, Umweri. The choice of youth on this tour is strategic as the government hopes to give them an insight into the state of affairs, especially in the area of infrastructure. This airport was completed in 15 months. The lighting we have here is Category 2. Category 2 means at the worst of all the weathers, a plane can land here with the lights. And the whole big airports in the whole world, like Heathrow and so on, 90% of them use Category 2. So it is with all these qualities, all these characteristics, that make this airport get a categorization of uh, uh, Category 4F. What you mean by 4F is that the biggest plane known to man can land here. From the runway, the team moves to the meteorological garden where the weather readings and forecasts are done. Next is the fire truck area, then the water tanks and reservoir, and to the control tower. The terminal building is next, and gadgets including the digital conveyor are being fixed. The 12,000 sitting capacity International Convention Center, Oka, is the next spot of call where the youth through an elevator inspect the top floor of the gigantic structure. The inspection team retires at the governor's lodge where the youth express their views about the tour. This is the first day I am visiting the site and we were impressed. The Anambra State International Passenger and Cargo Airport is 90% ready and according to the state government's calculations, it will be inaugurated on October the 28th.
charges is impacting heavily on cargo importers. That's coming from an operator in the industry who believes the charges should be more reasonable if businesses must thrive. Custom has improved its platform, uh, but the challenge is the tariff. You know, many of the shipments comes, now comes with VAT, which is 7.5% of the valued amount. That is a little bit high. And we're beginning to see our customers being frustrated, you know, by that. Secondly, is the, the uh, duty charges. Many of these items now, the customer has increased the tariff in such a way that a lot are on 20% duty and they still come with surcharge and related charges, surcharge, levies and all that. And most of the shipments that we bring in, the ones that uh, are, are highly moving in towards Nigeria that most of the customers need have this high end tariff. So my appeal would be to custom to look at the strain on the Nigerian businessman or companies or you know manufacturing companies, you know trading companies, um, including airlines too as well, to look in such a way whereby they can balance it. Australia's national carrier Qantas has announced that it's speeding up plans to restart flights to many destinations and upsize some planes amidst massive demand for international flying as quarantine restrictions ease for Australian citizens. The chief executive of the airline said for four of the last five weeks, the airline's international sales were stronger than domestic sales for the first time since the pandemic began. This 20 months is probably the darkest period in Qantas's 100-year history. It's meant that we've had the ground aircraft stand down people and restructure the business. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's very clear that because Australians have rolled up their sleeves and taking the jab, we can see that light. We're getting more aircraft back in the air we're starting more international operations, and very importantly, we're getting more of our people back to work. First of all, we've now moved those flights earlier because of that, and we've added 20 flights to London in particular, and demand has been massive. In a few hours, a large number of those flights sold out. There's extremely strong demand of people wanting to get back into Australia for Christmas. We've also seen now of four of the last five weeks that Qantas's sales are bigger on international than they have been on domestic. That hasn't happened um, since COVID began. So it is very clear there is pent up demand. There's massive demand for Australians wanting to see the family and relatives. Australia is ready for takeoff. You can see it all around us. You can see the staff readying themselves. The ground crew have been doing the work they've needed to do, the maintenance teams, and we're ready for takeoff. With the excitement to fly, the airline's engineers are preparing the fleet to ramp up international flying starting November 1, when Sydney opens fully to vaccinated citizens and permanent residents without quarantine. With the exception of its Airbus A380 Super Jumbos, which remains stored in the Mojave Desert in California, most Qantas International Fleet has already been doing some limited flying on cargo and repatriation flights. So we stored them in the Mojave Desert. Australia applied strict border rules in March 2020 that stopped citizens from exiting without special permission and required two weeks of hotel quarantine for all arrivals, leading Qantas to stop regular international passenger flights. Qantas engineers at Sydney Airport checked brakes and tires and caught up on some minor maintenance work on its fleet of A330 planes that were flying on lighter shadows. What we do is have them on a bit of a part-time schedule. So they've been doing one day a week instead of seven days a week. So there's quite a bit. There's things like making sure the tires, the brakes are ready, doing some lubrication, and also catching up on some um, uh, sort of overdue maintenance that, we, that we've been, it's been really bugging us for a while to get done. 
In California, Cantas has a team of engineers in Los Angeles that regularly drive two hours to the Mojave Desert to carry out checks on the A380 fleet stored there. Place to store them. Cantas expects five of its 12 A380s to return to service from July 2022 for London. The 1st of November resumption marks a major milestone for an airline that has done little international flying since March 2020 and has lost about $15 billion of revenue due to the pandemic. While the airline's fleet remained on ground, all 11,000 of the airline staff idled without pay. Around half its workforce will return to work by early December as domestic and international flying returns to more normal levels. At London City Airport, the air traffic controllers have gone. Perched above the terminal building, the old control tower with its panoramic windows is empty of controllers. Monitors, a few pens and some hand sanitizers are all that remains. City became the world's first major international airport to switch to a remote digital tower earlier this year and went public less than two weeks ago. The airport nestled beside former dockyards a few miles east of London's Canary Wharf financial district is London's smallest. Before the pandemic, it had 5 million passengers a year, mostly traveling on business to European destinations like Frankfurt and Amsterdam. City planes now take off and land guided by air traffic controllers who are based 90 miles away. They direct the airport using information from a newly built taller control tower stacked with 16 high definition cameras and multiple sensors. The switch to remote air traffic control has raised a few eyebrows, but London City's chief operating officer says so far it has worked seamlessly. Metal spikes guard the top of the 50-meter tower to protect the cameras from birds, and each camera has a self-cleaning mechanism that stops insects and debris from blurring images. Those images then travel multiple separate high-speed fiber links to the remote center in Swanwick, Hampshire, where London City's air traffic controllers are relocated. The live sound of the airport is piped into the new control center so that controllers still hear the plane's engines roaring into life and the reverse thrust of touchdown. And the 14 screens in the Swanwick control center are not at risk from a buffering internet or lost connection. For City Airport, the new remote tower, which costs just less than £20 million to design and build, is not about saving money. With the new technology, City's current number of controllers will be able to handle more plane movements once flying recovers after the pandemic. City will also be able to handle 45 plane movements per hour, up from 40 in 2019. So we think that the, uh, the digital tower is going to revolutionise how we can deliver airport services. So it allows us to reproduce what we do today, it allows us to further enhance that job, and potentially it allows us to group together different airports in one place and present different ways of efficiently delivering the service to, to the airport customer. So it really is the, the, the tip of the iceberg of, of uh, improvement to what we can do for, for the airport ATC. So fundamentally, um, the job hasn't changed. Uh, it's still about the controller's eyes finding the aircraft and monitoring it visually. The difference is we're using screens instead of windows. The airport's plan for a remote tower dates to 2016, when it realized that in order to go ahead with a 500 million pound expansion plan to fit in extra bigger planes, it would need to significantly invest in the old control tower. It decided instead to build a new one, given the efficiency benefits offered by a new remote technology developed by Swedish company Saab. Heathrow, Britain's busiest airport, is also considering remote control towers in its future plans. This is where we disembark on this flight. Next week is another date. I'm Bukola Joe Oketumbi. Okay,